pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thy lovest, and give thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering unto one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go down and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to pass to which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a ticket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering and the steed of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehoviah, and as it said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, and only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up, and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told to Abraham, saying, Behold, Malachi, she hath also borne children unto thy father, brother, Nahor, Huz his firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Kimula the father of Aram, and Jesi, and Hazor, and Philadash, and Jilapath, and Bethlehem. And Bethlehem begot Rebekah. These eight Malachi did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Riyama. She bare also Teba, Gathna, and Daesh, and Malachi. Now let's pray. Uh, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for everything that you've done for this church. And I pray that you would just bless Tommy McMurtry to preach a good sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, it is really good to be here. It is a total pleasure, and I definitely appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate uh, all of you coming out, and I am, uh, you know, just encouraged by what I see. And uh, I'd add, you know, Brother Josh mentioned, you know, things I'm not supposed to say in Canada. I, I've been known for uh, being culturally insensitive quite a bit. You know, I mean, I, I'm an Illinois boy. I'm not, you know, 
lived in Illinois my whole life and not been around a whole lot of different cultures and things and so often I do things that are offensive to other cultures not intentional so you know I don't and I don't know how different things are in Canada so I'm like is there things I'm not supposed to say stuff you're not supposed to bring up you know are we allowed to you know talk about whose country's better and things like that or is it gonna get me so you know, I always I always wonder about stuff like that and I will say that for a long time I kind of had the wrong impression of Canada um, you know Growing up in Illinois, I didn't meet a whole lot of Canadians. The first one I really remember meeting, um, there was a guy that I knew when I was 19. And a year or two later, we were somewhere and I saw him, and he uh, introduced me to his wife. He had just got married. He married a girl from Canada, and she had a mustache. Yeah, and um, it was a woman. I was just like, good night. Canadian women all have mustache. So I like had it in my she was she was hideous, and so I just like. I just had it in my head that like Canadian women are ugly, you know, they have mustaches and stuff like that. Wow. And that's not true, I, I, but that was just kind of in my head for a long time. And then, you know, I didn't have a lot of, you know, more interaction over the years with people from Canada and stuff. And then uh, I, you know, started getting to know he who will not be named here. Uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. And I was like, and this guy is weird. I was like, but maybe that's just Canada, you know? And then started getting to know more people from Canada. I was like, you know what? These people from Canada are pretty normal. You know, y'all act a lot like Americans. I hope that's not offensive, all right? But at the same time, I don't see a huge difference culturally, and I might be insulting you like crazy with that right there. But at the same time, I don't mean it as an insult. Y'all seem like very normal people, and get along with you great. And I uh, definitely enjoyed, you know, I've met a lot of you at different places. Some of you here have even been to our church before, and uh, I've definitely enjoyed getting to know all of you. And I, I will say, too, one of the things I was surprised about, because, you know, in the United States, we think of Canada as being just this horrible, godless country, you know, with no good churches, and therefore there's, like, no safe people in Canada, you know, and, and that was kind of how it was in our minds. And I will say, when I kind of got involved with this movement, I started finding out about all these people that are in Canada that are soul winners. I'm like, there's soul winners in Canada? You know, that just kind of blew me away. And... You know, and then and I'm just going to tell you right now, you know, when I started getting to know some of these and then, you know, you find out these people, they don't have good churches to go to. And when they do go in churches, they're not always real welcome. It makes me mad because, you know, when I started my church, I would have, you know, given my right arm to have some good soul winners in the church. And it took a long time before some started coming and being a blessing. And so just the thought of a pastor trying to run off a soul winner from his church that just doesn't make sense to me that's right and i'm burdened for you know places that have good soul winners that want to hear good truth and want to hear hard preaching i don't think any of you from canada want to hear hard preaching <laughs> and i remember when uh you had the toronto event out here with pastor anderson i heard how many people came to it and i was just like really in canada you know so uh you know thank god there is a righteous remnant in canada and if there's something that I'm able to do to help encourage y'all, that's what I want to do. So, you know, when I was asked to come out and preach, you know, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm thrilled with uh, what y'all are trying to do out here, and I support it, and I, I appreciate Brother Gander just kind of stepping in, filling the gap. You know, places like this that don't have a lot of good churches, but they do have, you know, some good Christians, some good soul winners, love our preaching, you, do, you need to get organized. You need to... You know, work together. You need to humble yourselves and, and submit to one another, and be willing to let somebody lead you. And then, you know, pray that um, you know God will raise them up. And eventually, you know, I, I think we'll probably see you know Brother Gander be ordained, and you know, and be a pastor eventually. I believe that's what's going to be God's will. And so, I hope you'll be supportive. You know, don't get lifted up with pride. Don't act like you're too good, uh, you know, for this because maybe he doesn't have some credentials that you think you ought to have just yet. Help him get there. And if, he's, if, it, if this place is being a success and you all are doing great things, there's not going to be any question about what ought to be done. But, you know, if it's just going to be, you know, another circus, you know, that's just going to, that's going to ruin it for all of you. So um, just, you know, keep up the good work and keep doing the soul winning. Keep on, uh, you know, being a blessing and encourage each other. And I do, I believe God is going to bless you for it in a great way. I have no doubt about that. So. But anyway, let's go ahead and I want us to draw your attention to verse 7 of Genesis chapter 22. Look what it says here. It says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That's a pretty good question. 
in order to do a burnt offering, you didn't need to have a lamb. That's just kind of a necessity in this situation. And Isaac is seeing everything but the most important thing that they need. So obviously he brings it up to his father. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went out, both of them, together. And you all know the story. And th this story right here, this is probably, I think, you know, arguably the greatest, you know, examples of faith that we ever see from any man in the Bible. Right. It's, uh, uh, it's an, an instance that God brings up over and over again. Yep. God named Abraham as the father of those who have faith because of what he did right here. Amen. He was already Amen. saved before this story takes place. But this is an example where Abraham showed his faith to the world in such a way where God is just constantly pointing back to this and saying, you know what? My guy called Abraham a friend Amen. of God. Amen. Hey, you see this guy with the faith? That's my friend right there. You say that about somebody that you're impressed with. You like to mention that you're a friend to somebody you think will make you look good. Because you have a friend like that. And Abraham, he was called a friend of God. And you know what happened. He went forth and he was going to do it. He was going to go through with it. He was going to kill his son. We see in the New Testament, Abraham had such great faith. He believed that God would just be able to raise his son from the dead. In his mind, it's like that's what God's going to have to do because God promised that he was going to multiply his seed as the stars and he was going to do it through Isaac. Abraham had that much faith in the word of God that he believed that even if he killed his own son, that God would raise him from the yeah. dead Amen. at a time when no one ever had been raised from the dead before. Amen. He didn't have the Gospels. He didn't know that Lazarus hadn't happened yet. None of those things had taken place. And Abraham believed that God could do that. And so Abraham, after this event takes place, after God uh, provides that ram that he, he goes and, and kills in the stead of Isaac, it says, Abraham called the name of that place, verse 14, Jehovah Jireh, and it is said to this day in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And that term Jehovah Jireh, it means the Lord will provide. And God did provide in the story. And so not only is this a great story about Abraham and his faith, but this is also a story about God and his provision. Right. It's a story about how God once again came through. You know, it's also a foreshadowing, I believe, of God coming through with the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the earth, Jesus Christ. We all today are able to go out and go soul winning and tell people how to go to heaven and tell them how they can know for sure they're saved because of the fact that provision for the penalty of their sins has been provided by Jesus Christ. And so the title of my message this morning is called Where God Thrives. Where God Thrives. Because, you know, throughout history, God's people have always had problems with having doubts and even making excuses for God when things don't go the way they think they should. But thankfully, there have always been those, in spite of everyone else making excuses, in spite of everyone else acknowledging the facts of the situation, like for example, there's no lamb. Despite that, we, have, we see time after time, God doing great things anyway, just because there were people there who were of faith. And so right here, we did. We looked at probably one of the greatest stories of someone who had faith. And the truth is, if we're not careful, we can get caught up in doing like the world has always done, just considering the circumstances that are surrounding us, considering the facts that are surrounding us, and forget about the God who is also surrounding us. Right. Forget about the God who is with us. And the truth is, the places where God tends to thrive are the places where we're usually making the most excuses right. and I just and really I've got two main points in this message I want to give you today about where God thrives because I do believe that when we stop and think about it when we actually look at your situation here in Canada in Toronto from a biblical perspective you're gonna find out that this is actually a location where God should thrive and be, and so first off we see that God thrives in hopeless situations. Okay, now I don't know if it's politically correct for me as an American to talk about how bad Canada is. Okay, I don't know. I don't want to insult everybody here. You know, I'm kind of that way too, man. I, I rip on my own country all the time, but you know, if you're not from America and you rip my country, you know, so, you know, then we're gonna fight, right? No, no, just kidding. I mean, 
but it is. It's, it's bad in our country, and it's bad here in this country. There's yeah. no doubt about it. We've seen examples of it here. You know what else? It's rude in this country, too, man. The honking that goes on in Toronto. <laughs> Good night. I've never I, I've heard that much honking since I was in New York City. Uh, bad as New York City uh, out here. And, you know, that's not really a compliment. But, yeah, it's bad. We can talk about all the bad laws. We can talk about... Just all the perversion that's being promoted yep. today. You know, I've been hearing, uh, one of the guys we talked to today, Solon, he brought up a lot of the just junk that's going on in Canada. He was talking about the all-gender bathrooms and things like that that are, that are being pushed and that are going on. That's the type of, that is the reality of the situation you're in. And if we're not careful, we'll sit around and say, you know what? We can't build a good church in Toronto. This city's too wicked. You know, we can't have a good church you know, in Canada, our law, the laws are too bad. We've got this problem. We've got that problem. The churches stink. You know, there's no way we can do anything that needs to be done in a place like Canada. But the truth is, you know, we're not supposed to be looking towards the politicians to see a work from the Lord. Right. We're not supposed to be looking towards, you know, um, you know, just even the church itself. You know, we're supposed to be looking to the Lord. Amen. That's who we're supposed to be looking at to see great things happen. And we see that God thrives in hopeless situations. Look over at Romans chapter 4, and this is a uh, this is a reference to Abraham. It says in verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in the faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And you say, well, that was Abraham. But then it says... Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed Amen. if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So we see here that Abraham, he was somebody, he did not stagger at the promise of God right. through unbelief. He was not weak in the faith. The Bible says that he was fully persuaded and what he was fully persuaded is that God would be able to give him a son when he was 100 and his wife was 90. That is not a good situation. Right. That is not a situation, you know, where we're looking at thinking, all right, you know, if we're going to have a you know, family that's going to grow into a full nation of people, when you don't look to the man and the woman who's 190 years old to see something happen. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to start in a place like that. And, you know, if we're thinking as humans, it doesn't think, you know, it doesn't make sense to think, hey, let's do something great in Canada. Let's start in a place like Toronto. Or if you even want to do a great revival anywhere, let's start in a place like Canada. You wouldn't think that. That doesn't really make sense. But isn't that where God tends to move often? Yeah, he tends to work in places where it doesn't really make sense. You know, if it had been a healthy couple that, you know, God was going to use, well, you know, they were just healthy. You know, they were of good stock. She was able to have a lot of children. There'd be no surprise there. But when it, when God did this with a man who was 100, a woman who was 90, a woman whose womb was dead, a woman who, I mean, years had passed since, you know, it would be normal for her to have children, right there we see God ends up getting the glory for it. And this was, this was a hopeless situation, yet Abraham didn't lose his hope. Amen. And you know, it's amazing how many people who claim to be saved, have the faith of Abraham, claim to be the children of Abraham, but yet whenever an opportunity for God to do something or somebody has a vision for God to do something area, they tend to look at the sur surroundings. They tend to look at the circumstances and say, this isn't going to work here. Right. This isn't a good place. This isn't the kind of place where God, God's going to want to do something. And you know, the truth is, why wouldn't God want to do something in a place like Toronto? I didn't realize how big Toronto was. Right. You know, like million, how many millions of people are out here? Why wouldn't God want to do a work in a place like Toronto with the amount of souls that are out here. That's right. It would make perfect sense that God would actually want to do something here, but yet people look at the situation, they look at the odds, they look at the numbers, they look at the situation, and then they do, they just give up. 
they just faint in their own minds instead of saying, this is an opportunity for me to see God do something. God's greatest miracles were during the greatest challenges. I mean, what, what, you know, when we stop and talk about some of the greatest miracles that God ever did, you know, what's usually one of them we think about from the Old Testament? It's like, if I could see one miracle from the Old Testament, one of mine I like to think of, I think of is the parting of the Red Sea. Amen. I would have liked to have seen that. I watched that stupid Exodus movie with Christian Bale uh, just because and I was watching that and I was getting furious to the whole thing. It was so unbiblical. Yep. It was trash. But I kept watching it because I wanted to see the party of the Red Sea. <laughs> and then the, uh, I was like, I'll, I want to see how they made that look. You know, this is probably, you know, that's probably going to be pretty cool with technology and things like that. That stunk. It didn't even part. It just like all sunk down. And then all of a sudden it like came back with a great big tidal wave with Pharaoh and Moses got caught in it too trying to save Pharaoh's life. It was so stupid. But you know, I wanted to watch, I wanted to see the party of the Red Sea. It stunk. All right. But listen, that was a pretty amazing miracle, wasn't it? Right. But notice in that miracle, well, look what it says in, in verse 10. It says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh to the children of Israel, lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And notice in this situation, this what this probably one of the greatest miracles that we see God do in the Old Testament. It was in an impossible situation. Right. They are in an area where they are trapped. There is no strategic advantage to where they're at. They have no weapons, and here we have a people with no weapons in a horrible strategic location for a battle coming up against one of the great, probably the greatest army in the world at that time with their chariots. They haven't got a chance. Right. But yet, what happens? We see God greatly glorified. Now, notice, too, Israel's not even glorified in this situation. When they're calling on the Lord here or crying out to the Lord, they're not crying out to him for help. They're crying out to him in anger. Mm. Why are you letting this happen to us? Mm. Thankfully, there was one guy there that had some faith. We have Moses there, but yet, who gets credit for this is God gets the credit for this. Right. This is one story where there's no doubt who got credit for leading, getting the children of Israel out of Egypt, it was God. He got all the Amen. credit for it. I mean, one of the most amazing miracles, he had the pillar of fire that was darkness on one side, light on the other side, you know, that got in between Pharaoh and his army and the children of Israel. I mean, just an amazing situation. We see God feeding them with angels' food, man in the wilderness. I mean, miracle after miracle, God did them in impossible situations. God did not do this miracle of delivering them from Egypt in a situation where they had weapons, where they had a, a strategic location, when it came to a battle, it didn't, he didn't do it in any of those things. He did it in a situation that was impossible, a situation that was hopeless. And you know, we can't expect God to glorify himself where there's no challenge. God's going to do things in ways that are going to show his power. Look at Isaiah 52.10, I like this verse right here. It says, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. What does that mean? He's made his arm bare. You know, he's trying to show his muscles, you could say. All right? That's what the guy does. Just wanting to you know, show, hey, I've got some power here. He's going you know, to flex the bicep or whatever. And it's talking about him bearing his arm. What's he doing? He's showing his might. He's right. showing his strength. God wants to show his power. God, God wants to glorify himself in the things that he does. And so God's going to do it in places where he's actually going to get the glory. You know, nobody is going to be that surprised about a guy who maybe starts get, has, gets a big church going in the Bible Belt down south. Where everybody's Christian, everybody's Baptist. Nobody's going to be that surprised about it. But, you know, you do it in a place like Toronto. You know, people are going to look and they're going to say, you know what? 
Maybe God's in on that thing. God's not always good. God uses exceptionally talented people, you know, smart people, but most of the time God doesn't use those people. God doesn't always, you know, God, if God uses the, I mean, just polished, gifted speaker that just never stutters, never says a false word, just, I mean, just always, you know, just knows how to captivate that audience. You know why people are going to think that guy's church succeeded? Because he's such a great speaker. You know, if he's got the talent, if he's got the brains, everyone's going to think, man, you know, this guy's just got such great leadership skills. But, you know, when God uses, some of the people that God usually uses, it's usually people who don't have a lot of that stuff going for them. They don't have the looks, they don't have the charisma, they don't have the talent, they don't have the brains, but yet God does great things anyway. And you know what people do in that situation? They look and they say, I think God's doing that. God ends up being glorified in that. And so God, he likes to show his power. It is not God's job to make us look good. Right. It's our job to make God look good. Amen. That's right. And we make God look good when we're just kind of there having faith and letting God use us. And truth is, Jesus' greatest miracles that he did while he was on earth were at funerals, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Those were the ones that got things, you know, the thing that got the Pharisees ready to kill Jesus more than anything, it was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Four days the man had been dead. Now, he had already raised others from the dead, but these were people they could have said, well, they were just, you know, passed out. They weren't completely dead. But with Lazarus, it had been four days. Many people had been there. They had been with the family. They, there was no doubt that Lazarus was dead. And so what did they do? Man, when they heard about that, they were like, we've got, we've got to stop this man. We've got to kill this man because he showed his power in a great way in the most hopeless situation. Four days, it's too late. That's this, Dead is too late, but not for God. Amen. And that's where he thrives. These are the stories that we all talk about. They're the greatest miracles. God does his greatest works in the most desolate places. Look what it says in Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Now, this is, this is the story of the second time that God brought water from a rock. But I want you to notice this here. It says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin, in the first month. And the people of Odin Kadesh, and Miriam died there, was buried there. And then in verse 10, it says, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said to them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? So notice in this story how God, and I, everything's on purpose in the Bible, how God decided he's going to do the miracle of water from a rock. He did it in a desert, not in a rainforest. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because when God's going to show his power, he's going to leave no doubt. Right. There's some places if he'd have done it, well, there, there was a spring there already about to erupt. You know, there was, but when God's making water come from a rock, there's no other explanation than God in that situation. And so God does stuff like that in places like desert. God fed them in a wilderness. God did these things in the most impossible places. He parted the Red Sea, the battle at Jericho, it, that's another, you know, God didn't go and tell us a story about some little village without walls that they defeated. He told us a story about a city with massive walls that could not be taken down by man. And he told us about an army that did nothing except march around it. One time for six days and then seven times on the seventh day and then yell. Who do you think is going to get the glory in that situation? There's no doubt God got the glory for all those things. God wins his greatest battles in the most impossible places. When uh, Sennacherib came up against Hezekiah, I mean, this massive army that surrounded them, taunting him. I mean, they didn't have, Israel didn't have a chance in that story, but yet they won. Why? And who got the glory for that? God did. God won that battle for them. God is going to do the work where he's going to get the most glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 26, I've always kind of used this as my, as my life verse because, you know, I've asked myself many times, you know, Lord, why, why do you use me? I know a lot more talented people. Uh, a lot more people should be able to do these things better. But the Lord gave this to me years ago. In fact, when I announced 
uh, to my home church that, you know, I, um, you know, I believe the Lord wanted me to be a pastor. I got up and I read this verse of the congregation, and it says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God uses people who don't have it all. Why? Because if they have it all, then they could glory in his presence. And that is not what God wants. God is going to use people that are usually lacking in some areas. Just because of the fact that God wants to get the glory. God wants to end up using them. And, and listen to, there's when it comes to certain things, a lot of times God ends up giving people you know, talents and abilities, things where they weren't very good at before. They end up getting good at it later. God ends up, you know, you, um, you know, I believe blessing them in those areas because they were faithful with what they had. And God multiplies their gifts. I've seen that with people who they weren't very good speakers. They weren't very good singers. They weren't very good, you know, they, weren't, they didn't really seem like they were smart. But they used what God gave them and God just multiplied it in their life. And all of a sudden now they're really good speakers. All of a sudden now, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of charisma before, but now they do seem to have some charisma. It's like God's just blessing them in a great way. And when you see that, when you see God take someone who maybe has that personality of a brick wall, you know, who doesn't have a whole lot going for them, and then all of a sudden they're just being obedient to God, and then you see these things develop in their life, you know who gets the credit in that situation? God does. Amen. And you know, too many times people... They're always looking for that hot shot pastor. You know, they're always looking for this guy that's just got it all and he's all that and a bag of chips and, and everything. You know, I'll get behind that guy. You know, I want to get behind the guy that, you know, you know they, they want the King Saul is what they want. They want the guy that's head and shoulders above everyone else. They want the extremely gifted person. But you remember, God gave Israel, when they demanded a king, God gave them exactly what any group of people would want. The guy with the looks, the guy with the strength, he had the height, he had it all going for him. But then, we all know how that worked out. It didn't work out good because all of a sudden Saul got lifted up with pride. Saul thought he, he was all that. And God had to end up humbling him. He took him out. And then, the next time, God gave him the kind of person he was. God gave him David. And David, of course, did a lot of great things for God. But I'm telling you right now, don't sit around just waiting for the perfect situation. Don't sit around waiting for the perfect people to come along. You work with what you've got, you do what you can with what God has given you, and you let God multiply it. And if you're lacking in a great way, man, our church, when we when we started our church, it it's almost embarrassing, you know, the the fine our finances. If you looked at our financial statements from the first years of our church, it's like, how did we do anything? I mean, it's like we had no money, but you know, we worked with what we had, we did what we could, and God began to multiply. You know, we we didn't have a lot of things starting out. We didn't have a lot of people. You know, I mean. But we, we've always not ours. We've always been soul winning ever since we started the church, even when it was only a couple people, even when it was just me many times. We worked with what we had. We did what we could with what we had. And God has multiplied it. And then even some of the people in our church who, you know, we've seen it with them who used their talents with what they had. Maybe it wasn't that great at first, but now we're seeing God multiply. They're doing, they're doing it better. That's what God does. You've got to just be faithful with what you have. And if you're lacking something, you know what? Say, praise the Lord. I'm just going to have to have God's help on this thing. Right. And the truth is, when we are lacking something in our churches or even in our own personal lives, all that does is it makes us more dependent on God. And that's right there, a recipe for success. Amen. But too many times... We're waiting till we have it all, till all the pieces are in place with every little thing so it's all perfect and it's like we forget to factor in God. Let God fill in all those missing pieces that we have and you'll be just fine because the truth is 
God does his greatest works where he's going to get the most glory. And God will get, I believe God would get more glory getting the great church going up here than he would down in the Bible Belt. I really, I really do believe that. You know, no one, God's going to get more glory by somebody who maybe, you know, is doesn't have the greatest skills, personality than he is from, you know, Dr. Eloquence. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to give Dr. Eloquence and all of his talents the credit for everything. That's not what God does. Yeah. See, what God wants to do, turn over to Psalm chapter 78. This is what this is what God wants to do. God wants to furnish a table in the wilderness. That's what he wants to do. Look what it says in Psalm 78. Let's read verse 18. It says, And they tempted God in their hearts by asking him meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Hey, listen, it's not a good thing when you are the one asking if God can do things in doubt. Okay? They're tempting God with this. Kind of like when Rabshakeh, he's speaking against Israel. I was just preaching on this thing Sunday night when Hezekiah told him when they were speaking, you, don't, you all just hold your peace. He's telling them, don't listen to your king. When he tells you your God can save you, don't listen to him. Your God can't save you. And the people of Israel, they just kept their mouths shut through that whole thing. While this man is blaspheming God, while he's saying God can't do things, and you know what? God heard what he was saying. And God dealt with them. Remember the other story in the Bible? Where they said, you know, and I'll probably, I always get this mixed up, but they talk about how, you know, our gods are gods of the hills, you know, theirs are the valleys, and so, you know, let's fight them in the hills, you know, because our gods would then defeat their gods, and, be, and the Bible says because they said that, God defeated them there. Right. Oh, really? You think I can't fight in the hills, or I'm, I'm probably getting mixed up? I'll show you, and God defeated. God defeated them, and so many times people. Even Christian people, they're often, you know, can God do this? You know, can God start a church? Don't be on the wrong end of that. Don't be saying that in the wrong way because God's probably going to prove it, but you're not going to be a beneficiary of it. You're not going to be a part of it. Let's keep reading verse 20. It says, Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this. And was wrought, so a fire was kindled against Jacob, and his anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God, and trusted not in his salvation, though he had commanded the clouds from above, and opened the doors of heaven, and rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food, he sent them meat to the full. And so notice, and then it goes on, remember how he brought those quails in? Because here, God's already doing this miracle of giving them manna in the wilderness. God's feeding them angels' food. He's giving them the food of heaven to eat. But then all of a sudden, ah, can you give us meat? And God did. God, you want some meat? And God brought in meat like they'd never seen before. And they ate it, and then God ended up letting them eat it. And then you know what he did? He slew the fattest of them. Why? Because he was fine. I'll show you. I can do it. And God gave them meat, but then he killed, he killed many of them. Because right. let me tell you, that, that attitude of doubt, it is a wicked thing, especially for the people who had crossed the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And think about this, okay? Now, most we've not seen any physical miracles like that. We've not seen a parting of the Red Sea. We've not seen the ten plagues come on our enemies or anything like that. We've not got to see water come from a rock. But do we not claim as a church to be a spiritual people? You know, do, do we not claim to be of the Spirit and to follow the things of the Spirit? Do we not claim that we're trying to walk after the Spirit and all those things? Well, let me ask you this. If God can resurrect you from the dead spiritually, why would we go questioning anything else? You know, think, think about how insulting it is for the God who we claim saved us for us to doubt whether or not he can do other things for us. We know that it's God's will for a believer to be in church. So if we as believers, I mean, we believe God, well, God saved me, but you know, God can't, you know, God can't get a church going. God can't get, God can't build a church. 
in my area. I'm just going to tell you right now, if you think that, if you're going to have that attitude, I think God probably is going to do it, but you're not going to be in the receiving end of it. You're going to end up being the one that gets thrown out of the church. You know, because, um, you know, causing trouble or whatever. And that kind of thing, it makes God angry. And the truth is, God can furnish a table in the wilderness. God can start a church in a wicked country, in a wicked city. God can start a church in a small town like where I'm at. God can do whatever he wants to do. And so, and God's going to do these things in places where things are lacking. God did, well, I, mean, I would say the greatest story of a sacrifice next to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross is in the story of Abraham when he was going to offer up his son Isaac. And notice that sacrifice, it came when there was something greatly missing. Something that was needed, and God provided for it. And you know, so we, we've got we've to get this, you know, we've got to get this right attitude. Don't worry about what's missing in many situations. Just let God fill those things. Let God take care of those things, because God thrives in hopeless situations. And then the second thing, God thrives in the presence of a hopeful audience. God thrives in the presence of a hopeful audience. Look what it says in Mark chapter 13 and verse 58. Mark 13 verse 58. God thrives, or Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 13 verse 58. says, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know, you think about all the stories that we read about in the New Testament of Jesus healing people, yep. you know, cleansing lepers, you know, recovering the sight to the blind. I mean, what an amazing thing that must have been. What an, I mean, how amazing it must have been for the people who received the healings. Not just the people who watched the miracles, but the people who were on the receiving end of it. Well, here we have Jesus in a city, and yet... He doesn't do many works there because of their unbelief. They wouldn't trust him. He's in a, he's in a city that didn't have hope, mm -hmm. that weren't trusting in him right. and weren't believing in him. And so, you know, he didn't do many wonderful works there. And, you know, the truth is, you're all going to have a church right here. But if you're not going to have hope, if you're not going to expect God to do anything, he's probably not going to do anything. It's amazing how many people regularly, you know, you can, you can tell if they're expecting God to do something or not expecting God to do something in their church by just their attendance. N nobody would skip church if they thought God was going to do something great that day. That's right. Nobody would skip holding if they knew God was going to do something great well, in that day. If they were expecting God to show up and do something, you better believe that they're going to be there. But they don't because... I don't think God's going to do anything. Uh, there, we don't have anything special planned this Sunday. You know, the, the, there's no potluck. There's no whatever, you know, fun thing. You know, it, it, isn't it sick? I'm all for doing some fun programs and having fun as believers. I'm 100% for that. But, you know, it's just pretty sad how churches today are just turning into these, you know, social clubs where they've just got to constantly have these fun activities and if there's not bounce houses and clowns and acrobats at the church, you know, people aren't coming. Right. And it's always just pro well, one promotion after another. they got to find some way to keep the people entertained. And if there isn't some show coming that day, right. if there's not, you know, if, if the pastor hasn't announced, you know, the magician that's coming to church next Sunday, people aren't going to show up. They're not expecting God to do anything. And how that must make God feel. Well, as, as believers, we ought to have a full expectation that when we come together, that God's going to do something. I mean, after all, he said, for where two or three are gathered together in right. my name, Amen. there am I in the midst of them. Did, not, did God not call for us as believers to assemble together? Folks, they were assembling together in the Old Testament. And while a lot of things changed in the Old Testament, while the book of Hebrews teaches us a lot of things that change, the sacrifices, those things change, those are finished. And, you know, the Sabbath, that was finished. The book of Hebrews is telling us all these things that have changed. When he gets to Hebrews chapter 10, what did he say? He said, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, every pastor always likes to bring that up when it talks about church attendance. But what's interesting about that passage in, in context 
is that he was saying, well, a lot's changed. One thing I don't want you to change, one thing that did not change from the Old Testament to the New Testament was the assembling of the believers. Right. God wants his people coming together. He wants them with each other, and he wants to show up. He wants to be there in the midst of that, and he wants to do something. Amen. And what does he want? You know what he wants to do? He wants to bear his arm. He wants to show his power in some way. That's what God wants to do. And whenever we just go and we just get careless about it, we're not faithful, it's because we're not expecting anything. And when we don't expect anything, we don't get anything. That's what happened here in this city. And we can't let that happen. God thrives with those who also who find themselves with nothing left to do but depend on him. Now see, this is where... I think a lot of people end up missing. Turn over to Mark chapter 9. See, the problem is we're always trying to figure out, all right, what would work? All right, what do we need for a sacrifice? You know, we need the fire. We need the altar. We need all these things, but we also need a lamb, right? What do we need to have a good church? You know, we've got to have this. We've got to have that. We're, we're coming up with all these things. But often there's things that we're missing. Often there's something that we're lacking. And so what do we do? We just give up in many cases. Well, why, why are we even trying? We're, we're missing something. We've got a shortage in this area. You know, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. We don't, you know, and I hate that too. You know, even at, I was at a church one time and they were having a pastor's fellowship and barely anybody showed up for it. And I remember there was just a few people there. I showed up for it. I drove almost an hour to go to this meeting. And I remember sitting there in the auditorium, and it comes time to start, I'm sitting there in my pew, and the song leader just gets up there, and he just kind of looks at the pastor, like, we were supposed to start, there's barely anybody, you know. And he just, he looks at the crowd, he's like, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. You know, take your hymn books, you know, we're just like going through the motions, I'm like, what am I, chopped liver? You know, I, I mean, I came out here. Right, yeah. You know, let's, let's have some preaching. You know, let, let's get on with this. Let's sing the songs, but people look, oh, you know, the crowd's too small, whatever, and then they're, they just want to give up. They want to throw their hands up. They want to quit. But you know what? Sometimes I believe God is going to let us get to the point where we we are desperate, where we are lacking, because God thrives in places where people's only hope is Him. When they have nothing left to do but trust Him. Look at what it says in Mark 9, verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh them, he teareth them, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered them and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, he straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times that have cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter into him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead in so much that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said to them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So notice in this situation, this was one where Jesus' disciples, they couldn't even handle it. This man, he brings his son to their disciples. They weren't able to do anything. I mean, this was a son that they'd taken to the doctors. They had used every means they could. They tried every possible thing. They had nothing left but Jesus Christ. And even and I love this too, because even when Jesus asked him that question, if thou believest, all things are possible, and he cried out, he's in tears saying, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You know what? Sometimes it's okay for us just to admit, hey, I'm having trouble believing. Right. Just go ahead and admit, say, Lord, I'm having a tough time trusting you in this situation and ask him to help you with that. You know, say, Lord, I'm, I don't have a whole lot of faith. 
help me out with this, it's better that you be honest with God since he already knows anyway. If you're struggling with faith, if you're struggling with doubts, you might as well just go ahead and tell him since you already know and ask him to help you with that. But these people, they had nothing left to do but depend on him and turned out that works. Amen. And we find often in the scriptures, people, many times they would wait until they were desperate, until there was nothing left, then they would depend on him. And I believe God let them get to that point so they would finally realize whenever he does deliver them, you know, that it's because of him and he would get the glory for it. But you know what? I do believe that we ought to, you know, we ought to strive to not get to that point. You know, let's not wait until, you know, until we're desperate. Let's not wait and make Jesus the last resort. How about we just go to him first? How about we just right away say, you know, that's it. I'm, we're going. We have Jesus or nothing else. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna go try a bunch of other things first. And that's how a lot of people are with things. All right, we'll try this and this and this. You know, and, and then we'll go to Jesus. No, that's not the way it works. Just go to Him first. Because if you're gonna try everything first, if God really wants to do something in your life, He's gonna let all those other things fail first. So you might as well just bypass all that and just go straight to Him. And then God, because God also thrives with those who are obedient, even when it doesn't make sense. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Okay, what Mo, what uh, Abraham was doing here, it made no sense. It doesn't make sense to kill the son that God said, I'm going to multiply your seed with. That doesn't make sense. Right. That right there, if Isaac dies before having children, that ruins the promise of God, technically, doesn't it? I mean, he's dead, right? Yeah, we all know the end of the story. We all know that God can raise people from the dead, but that hadn't happened at that point. And God is often going to ask us to do things that don't make sense. It doesn't make sense to march around a city, you know, to defeat them. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to lead a multitude of people up against the sea where there's no other place to go. Right. None, none of these things make sense, and many of the things that God asks us to do, they don't make sense. You know, for example, you know what else doesn't make sense? I've had many people tell me this, you can't build a church from soul winning. That's what people, that, I had a pastor in my town tell me that. Some people, they left his church, they want to come over to ours because we had soul winning, he didn't have soul winning. And I was talking to him and he said, you know what, you know, I, I, mean, he, I forgot how many years he's been passing there, he's been there a lot longer than me, but he said, a soul winning lost its effectiveness in this area years ago. And you know, I, was, I wasn't talking to argue for anything, but then I remember, I remember I was thinking, I was like, I started thinking about our church and all the people that were in there from soul winning. Right. It's like most of the people in our church are there because we knocked on their door. So he's just an idiot, you know, for one. But but second of all, you know, yeah, in, in many ways it doesn't make sense. Okay? A lot of people don't like when you knock on their doors. You know, it doesn't really make you the most popular church in town when you knock on people's doors all the time. Right. You know, the other day we were knocking on a, a door in a small town not far from us. And I knocked it. We, we walked up on the porch, and the guy, he's like inside. He's like, no, I'm not interested. Get, you know, get out of here. So we, we turn around. We walk up. We go to the next house. And then he comes walking out on his porch, and he's like, they already, you know, they're, they're, he's like, they're not home. They've already got a church. That house already, ha they already have a church. And he's like, pointed all the house. And I just, I just, you know, I just said, you know what? We'll let them speak for themselves. Yeah. And then he was just like, you know what? I'll bet the people in your church wouldn't like it if you came up and were knocking on their door. Right. And I said, a lot of the people in my church come to my church because I knocked on their doors. Yeah. And I said, there's about 20 other people from our church out right now knocking on doors. I said, a lot of people respond well to this. <laughs> and and, we, you know, and he just, we, just, we argued back and forth a little bit and he, he stormed off and went inside. But you know, at the same time, doesn't it make a little more sense if you want to get a crowd to bring in the bounce houses, bring in the clowns, bring in the jugglers, 
bring in the purple lights, be trendy, you know, get the good best coffee, do all those things. I mean, that does kind of seem like it would make more sense as far as getting a crowd if that's what you're looking for. You know, it doesn't. I mean, it seems like it makes more sense. You know, to, to go to the money. You know, go 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 to the rich neighborhoods. You know, do the door hangers and all all that kind of stuff. You know, that does seem like in many ways the more effective thing. I mean, you think about the amount of doors that we knock and the amount of visitors we get. Right. It's not a it's not you know a great return in a carnal sense. Okay. Now we understand we're preaching the gospel. We understand people are getting saved. But as far as like what we get from it, there's not really that much. If if, if we're just if we're just going to be honest. But the truth is this is what God said to do, and it just so happens that the churches that are doing it are successful. That's right. The churches that are doing it are, are doing just fine. So the thing is, you can't always go off what makes sense. Okay, I'm not going to go to you know the idea days they have in the, in the United States with Josh Tice and his skinny jeans crowd. <laughs> Where they're going to have their roundtable discussions and talk about what's trending and all the new, hip, trendy ways to get people. To, I'm not going to go to that stuff, even if what they say makes some sense, versus what the Bible says that doesn't seem to make sense. The Bible's proven that just being obedient to God works. Amen. And while you can't really say, and a lot of times, you know, you know, I can't really show a chart and like give all these like physical examples of how this worked, but I'm just gonna. It works, and I have learned over the years. You know, the more we knock doors, the more our church grows, the more visitors we have. It's just the more we do. And it, you know, what's funny too, a lot of times when we're, especially when we're getting local visitors and stuff, it's not even from the areas that we knocked. But yet, it's like because we're just doing what God said, He brings them in anyway. That's just that's the way it works. And, and you know what you end up doing in that situation? Because this is what this is what happens. Whenever we've done like just really big pushes, I mean we've knocked like a ton of doors. Whenever we have visitors that next Sunday, you know I'm always looking at their visitor card, trying to see where they live, to see hey, this is this the area where you're knocking? Did they come as a result of our efforts yesterday? And you know what? It almost never is. Right. So you know what I? It, but if it was. If all our visitors were coming from the areas where we had knocked the doors, I would say our methods are working. Mm -hmm. We're doing a good job of bringing in the visitors. Right. But when it never is, it seems like, you know, sometimes it is, but what often it isn't, I just say, you know what? God must be blessed us for being obedient. Amen. That's right. Because I don't know what streets to go to. I don't know where the receptive people are going to be. I don't know any of that stuff. I'm just trying to do whatever. I, we're, just, we're just doing whatever we can. We're just trying to get every creature. Let's just have some kind of method. Let's you know, We've got the maps in the wall. Let's mark up the streets. Let's just try to get everything. We don't know where God wants us to go. We don't know where people are ready. But let's just do what God said to do and then see what God does. And it's just that's, that's the way he works. God thrives with those who are obedient. Even when it doesn't make sense, God thrives with those who get him a bigger audience. And what I mean by that, you know, God... There's a lot of people that are good at getting people interested in themselves. But God wants us to get people interested in Him. Okay? I don't need to go out and market myself in the community. That's not my job. My job is not to go and market me, you know, as this, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something I'm good at. But, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know and it's saying, I, 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 that's not what I'm trying to do. You know, all of our jobs as Christians is to promote Jesus Christ. Amen. Is to promote God. Amen. We're trying to make people interested in Him. Now, if you if you do your job, you can say, hey, you know, you need to come and you want to learn more about God. Well, you need to come visit our church. Our, you know, you can say our pastor. He's really good at teaching about God. I mean, he's he's always showing us just interesting things about God and about His Word. And if you come to this church and you get around these people, you're going to learn a lot of stuff about God. Get them interested in God. Amen. The last thing God wants is to use a peop, uh, you know, is going to use somebody that's just about getting people attracted to a man or even themselves. 
Oh, yeah, you need to come to our church because our church, man, we've just got the coolest people. You know, we've got, you know, our, we've got the most successful people with all the best jobs. And, you know, you'll be a part of this elite social club if you're there and you'll be somebody in the community. No. So you need to get around people, man. They love the Lord. Our right. people, the people in our church, they like to talk about the Bible. They like to talk about God. Once again, we're, we're getting people interested in God. And if we're doing that, if God's like, man, at that church, these the people who go there get really interested in me. God's going to send more people there. Because you know one of the things you know advertisers have learned? and you, They love to get you talking about their product. That's why they want you, you know, tweeting these things, sharing these things, you know, talking about a movie, tweeting about a movie. Because if we're all talking about a movie, okay, if we're all talking about, and I, and I have no interest in watching this movie, but I'm going to bring this one up because they successfully got it in my head. Last night when we were at that restaurant, I could see that Jack Ryan movie playing on that screen. All right, that was, play, was playing on that screen the whole time we were there. Uh, I mean, I, who knows how much money they paid for that. Now I'm talking about Jack Ryan. Now he's like, <laughs> but when we talk about when when you hear people talking about a movie, yep. all of a sudden you get interested in it. You weren't even thinking about it. Some of you now are thinking about going watch Jack Ryan. I think it was called because I just because I mentioned it. You realize how effective that is. Well, what if we're all when we come to church instead of talking about the ball game? You know how many people weren't sports fans until they went to a church and everybody in that church was talking about sports all the time, right. and then they got into sports. Yep. But a lot of people who maybe aren't really that interested in things of God, when you get around a bunch of people and they're all talking about this passage in the Bible, they're all talking about this doctrine, they're talking about Jesus, all of a sudden, those people, they naturally get interested in. Don't you all hate it when you're in the middle of a conversation and you've got nothing to contribute? Because you don't know anything about it, you just naturally then want to go learn so you can be a part of the conversation. And I'm telling you right now, if, there, if you as a people are talking about God and interested in God, it's going to attract other people to that. And if God sees that, man, these people, they're coming together to, get, to learn about me. God's sending people up here. God will grow your church in that way. There is no doubt about it because God thrives with those and does great things with those who give him a bigger audience. God thrives with those whose only hope is him. If you come up with a backup plan, God's probably going to let you use it. That's right. You know, I, you know what I'm afraid of, and I've se I've seen this a lot. I see it. I see it in this movement all the time, where there's people who they watch the preaching online, they see what's going on, they're watching what's happening with the soul winning, and they're interested in it. They're intrigued. All right. They see what's going on. They see the excitement, and what they do often is they think, I'm going to go try that out. I'm going to go try one of those churches. I'm going to go try the soul. And they, and they hear enough of the preaching online. They learn the lingo. They know what they're supposed to say. They know how they're supposed to look. They know, they know the whole nine yards. Okay? They, they watch enough videos. They know what to do. But you know what? It's not really in there. It's not, it's not really internal. They're just trying it out. Maybe their life's a wreck. Their family's a wreck. And they're thinking... I'll go try this and hopefully it will work. But if not, we'll go to something else. You know what? If that's your attitude, you're going to end up using that backup plan. God God thrives with those whose only hope is Him. You know what we need? We need people who are getting involved in this movement who are like, this is it. Amen. This is all there. This, it's this or nothing. That's right. It's God or nothing. But you know, there, a lot of people, I'm going to go try the salvation by grace through faith. You know, I'm going to go try the salvation that's without works. Let's go try that for a while, but if that doesn't work, I'll go back to the Catholic Church. Wow. That's not how that works. Right. You've got to actually believe it. Amen. Right. It's that you, have to, you have to actually believe it in your heart, and there are too many people out there today that are just trying out this movement. They're trying out being a Baptist. They're trying out Christianity, and God's not going to work in that situation. Amen. God's going to work with those who their only hope is Him, those who have placed their hope and trust in Him, and God thrives there, all of us in here who have put the hope of our righteousness in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, one of these days, God is going to literally transform us into His likeness. 
He's going to give us a brand new glorified body like the body of Christ. Those of us who have done, who are doing nothing to save ourselves, but to trust in Him, God is literally going to make us like Him one of these days. God's greatest work that He will ever do is still yet to come. And He's going to do it with those who are waiting on Him, hoping for Him. And if there's someone out there, they're trying this right now, but if it doesn't work, they're going to go back to work something. They're not really saved, are they? No. It's those who have put their hope in Him. They, they believed in their heart. And the greatest work yet is going to be done there. So too many people, they're making excuses today for not doing things that they know that they should be doing. And people, you know, they excuse often maybe the lack of something. You know, or the fact that something is an ideal situation, not realizing that is the place where God tends to do His greatest works. And truth is, if you feel like you're in a situation like that, what you ought to do is start reading your Bible and say, man, God did the works like that back then in those places. We've got some similar conditions out here. Mm. All he needs is we've got the desperate situation. Now we just need the hopeful audience. And we can all do that. And I believe if you do, you're going to see... God do great things. But if you don't, you're never going to see the power of God. You're never going to see God do anything. You're just always going to be sitting around just wondering why. And I believe I, I believe that there is there is no reason, in fact, there is every reason to believe that God will do a great work here in Toronto, Amen. Ontario. Amen. And I believe God has already is already doing a great work. Yeah. Saw nine people saved today. Amen. And I believe the best is yet to come. That's right. So just keep, keep up the good work and keep your hope in the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for everyone who's here today, Lord. I'm just encouraged by their attendance and by their uh, just faithfulness, Lord. I pray you'll, I pray you'll bless them, Lord. We uh, just pray you'll help all of us to stay dependent on you. Help us to realize that uh, you are our only hope. And I pray that we will, uh, Lord, sit around a hopeful audience, just uh, anxious to see what you're going to do. And I pray that you will. I pray you'll be honored and glorified by everything that is done out here. I pray when people think of uh, Sound Words Baptist Church, they're not going to think of uh, any one person here in this church, but they're going to think of Jesus Christ. That yes. This is a place where uh, God is definitely do some, doing something. The, the conditions aren't right. Uh, just, there's not everything that is needed in order for it to be successful as far as man's wisdom is concerned, but yet you're succeeding anyway. Well, there's no doubt you get the glory there. But that's what we want to see, and we're asking for it. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Great sermon. Thank you very much, Pastor. Yeah, it's true. We're uh, we're we're God, you know, excels. That's where we're always making excuses. Isn't that the case? We got a big long list. You think of the the woman that had the issue of blood, right? She could say, you know, I've I've been this way for so long. I, I've 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 been suffering. It's been hard. You know, I I've spent all my money on doctors. Everyone's abandoned me. I'm all alone. Now I come here and I want help and there's this, this press amongst and around Jesus. I can't get there. His disciples are close. They don't even know what's going on. But instead of making all of these excuses, right, she, she said, hey, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, yep. if I could just touch that. She, she had enough hope and enough faith to just say, if I could just get close enough to Jesus to touch him, right? What a blessing. What a, I mean, that's that's the truth, and that's what we have here. Hey, if we could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, we have everything stacked up against us. We've got all the problems. We've got all the, the hard cases, the, the people that are, you know, the challenges out there, the, the, the hard-headed Canadians. We're, we're secular at best, right? You know, we, we've even gotten rid of religion, right? We're going to move into secular humanism. But, but we can make all these excuses. But, hey, what if we could just, just get a hold of Jesus and allow him to do something? That's, that's what we have here. That's what we have in this church. Thank you, Pastor, for preaching that. That was a great encouragement. We're going to sing, uh, To God Be the Glory. Amen. 162. Did you know this one on the guitar, Pastor? All right. I'm going to lead, Pastor's going to play the music. To God Be the Glory. Let's stand together. He's going to try. Yep. Uh, <laughs> oh, there we go. Amen. To 
God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. Thank you, Lord, for the sermon. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor McMurphy for coming to Canada and bring it, and this church, too. Like, we're like, probably like the only few that go out, but there's still a wide harvest of people who need to get saved. So I bless the uh, rest of the day, bless Pastor McMurphy going home, and bless the rest of our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.